Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Celeste Slade. I am the Clinical Solution Leader for GE Women's Healthcare, and we are excited to bring this topic to you today, this lunch and learn for SBI called Contrast, a Better Mammogram. Before we get started, we'd like to take a few minutes to review some housekeeping tips and helpful hints. At the bottom of your screen, there will be multiple application widgets that you can use throughout the event. All of these widgets are resizable and movable. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. Under the resource list, you will find a copy of today's slide presentation and some additional helpful material as well. I'd also like to point out two other important widgets on your screen, and that's the poll widget and the question and answer widget. We will activate polls during our uh, session today and hope to get your feedback. And at any point during the event, you can enter a question. You will be having a live question and answer session with our experts um, and be able to pro provide those answers to you directly. We will certainly do our best to get all of the questions answer during the session. However, if we cannot, we will capture them and follow up by email. And lastly, an on-demand version of the session and this event will be made available in the next coming days. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator and speakers, all who are experts in the domain of contrast enhanced mammography and have built their programs to incorporate this critical technology in the world of breast imaging. Our First, our moderator is Dr. Elizabeth Morris. Chair of the Department of Radiology and Professor at the University of California, Davis. Our first speaker today will be Dr. Kathy Schilling, Medical Director at, Chris, at the Christine E. Lynn Women's Health and Wellness Institute at Boca Raton Regional Hospital. And secondly, our next speaker is Dr. Jason Shema, Assistant Professor of Radiology, Associate Director of Research, Division of Breast Imaging and Co-Director, Breast Imaging Fellowship at Thomas Jefferson University. Dr. Morris is a longtime user and successful user of contrast enhanced mammography um, and has had that success in her previous role implementing this technology. And now I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Morris. Thank you, Celeste. First of all, I want to welcome everyone back to SBI. We missed everyone last year with COVID. Um, but we're so glad that we can be again together this year, even though it's virtual. And I'm very excited about joining this Lunch and Learn session on contrast mammography. Uh, we, at my prior institution at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we instituted contrast um, eight years ago. So we were early adopters and we have found its use exponentially grow over the years to now we've done, I think, uh, north of 9,000 examinations. Personally, coming from an MR background, I was skeptical at first, but I became a very, very early convert. Um, and I think after you see the two presentations today, you probably will too. Okay, so now we're gonna ask you to have some fun with us. Since this is all about lunching and learning, and normally we would all be together and be able to talk maybe more informally, we're gonna pop up two polls on your screen. So the first is, how many of you have tried contrast enhanced mammography? You have 30 seconds to answer and then I'll share the results with you. Okay, um, so let's, okay. And the second question was, when you think of contrast enhanced mammography, how many of you think of it as a better mammogram for your patients? Okay, all right, thank you very much for that. So now we're going to hear from Dr. Kathy Schilling, who has been actively using contrast mammography for many years. 
Dr. Schilling will share her findings and what they've learned at Boca Raton Regional Hospital and how they've implemented contrast mammography so successfully and helped women improve outcomes. Dr. Schilling will also focus on its medical indications and main advantages of having the technology in the facility. So I wanna also remind you to keep uh, your questions because you, can, you will be free to ask questions in the Q&A later. So Dr. Schilling. So good afternoon, everyone. I wanna share some of my experiences with contrast enhanced spectral mammography with you. We um, had um, FDA approval uh, for CESM in 2011, and we implemented the examination at our center in 2014. And I have to say that also over the period of time that we've been utilizing this technique, and a lot of that has to do with the work that was came out of Germany from Dr. Kuhl, where she used abbreviated MRI and found additional cancers in patients of all levels of risk. So I'd like to first start with this illustration. This depicts tumor growth and how, what level of, um, of growth and what stage our different imaging technologies identify cancers. So if we start on the left, we know that cancers, when they're small, receive their nutrients and oxygen just by passive diffusion across the cell membrane. At a certain point, the cells become hypoxic and release a chemotactic agent into the surrounding tissue, most commonly thought of as VEGF. So VEGF causes the ingrowth of new vessels to help support the growth of the cancer. But you have to realize that the new vessels are abnormal. They have leaky basement membranes. And when contrast is injected intravenously, it leaks out around the tumor and gives us the opportunity to identify it on our imaging exams. With time and increased growth of the tumor, satellite lesions may form in the surrounding tissue and cells may break off and result in distant metastatic disease. So if we look at our different imaging tools, mammography and ultrasound are our anatomic imaging tools. They don't see cancers or identify cancers until later in their growth. They won't be seen until there's a mass or there's a distortion or there's calcifications formed, so relatively late. However, MRI and CESM are our functional imaging tools. We inject either gadolinium or iodine, and these contrasts circulate and puddle around a cancer. And again, we're able to easily identify them on our MRI or CESM. When we talk about our molecular imaging tools, those are our nuclear medicine tools, positron emission mammography and molecular breast imaging. With these, we inject either FDG or technesium sestamibi. And these radio tracers are taken up by cells proportional to their metabolic rate. So cancers having increased metabolic rate compared to normal cells will be easily identified on these imaging tools. Now I want you to realize with CESM on the low energy imaging, we are also obtaining information equivalent to a 2D mammogram. So we have the opportunity to actually obtain both functional and anatomic imaging with CESM, and that's unlike any other imaging tool that we have. Back in 2014, when we first adopted CESM, the indications for use were similar to those for MRI. We considered it a poor man's breast MRI, and these are the indications that we followed. They included the NCI lifetime risk of greater than 20%, determining the extent of disease in patients with duly newly diagnosed breast cancer. In patients who had a personal history of breast cancer who were treated with lumpectomy, monitoring neoadjuvant therapy response, and having a history of pathologic atypia or high-risk pathology. So I'd just like to take a moment to show you some cases which were performed with these indications. This first patient had a remote history of lumpectomy on the low energy imaging, you see calcified fat necrosis medially in the region of a prior lumpectomy. But on high energy imaging, we see an area of enhancement, about a one centimeter area of enhancement in the upper outer aspect of the breast. This was not identified on targeted ultrasound. So she went to MRI, which showed similar findings, and MRI biopsy identified invasive ductal carcinoma. 
This next patient was BRCA positive and she had CESM for high risk screening. She had dense breast tissue and there was a new sub centimeter irregular mass identified in the upper posterior medial aspect of the breast on low energy imaging. On her high energy imaging, there was subtle enhancement of the area. She was taken to ultrasound and a small solid mass was seen with an echogenic rim. It was poorly defined and demonstrated significant tissue stiffness on shear wave elastography. Ultrasound biopsy identified a small invasive ductal carcinoma. This patient had group calcifications in the right breast. It was found to be DCIS at the time of stereotactic biopsy. She underwent CESM for staging. And on high energy imaging, she showed an extensive area of segmental non-mass enhancement consistent with intermediate grade DCIS, the majority of which was non-calcified. She went, underwent mastectomy, which confirmed this finding. This patient was also at high risk and had a CESM for screening. She showed a new non-calcified sub-centimeter mass in the medial aspect of the breast, and you can see it persisted on spot compression imaging. On high energy imaging, there was subtle enhancement of the area, and she underwent a targeted ultrasound, which showed a small solid mass with minimal tissue stiffness. This was biopsied under ultrasound guidance and was found to be an invasive carcinoma. Now, just recently, about three weeks ago, we got the opportunity to pre perform uh, CESM uh, guided breast biopsies. And this patient is an interesting case. She was 48 years old and was considered at intermediate risk. She had multiple prior ben benign breast biopsies, I think six or eight of them. So multiple tissue markers in her breast. She had a new one centimeter enhancing mass at six o'clock on the left breast on screening MRI. She underwent two attempts at MRI guided biopsy, but the lesion did not enhance, so biopsy was not performed. She subsequently underwent CESM, which showed enhancement corresponding to that found on MRI. A CESM biopsy was recommended, and you can see the scout image with the area well identified. On post fire imaging, you can see there's good targeting of the lesion. Multiple specimens were obtained and a tissue marker was placed at the termination of the procedure. This was found to represent a low grade invasive ductal cancer. And what's interesting to me about this case is that she, despite the fact that she underwent two attempts at MRI biopsy, the lesion did not enhance. And that's probably because the injection of gadolinium is performed with the breast under compression. Whereas for CESM, the injection of iodine is performed without compression. The compression is not instituted until about two minutes after um, the circulation of the contrast. So I don't know where this is gonna play with us in the future if we see additional patients who don't enhance at the time of anticipated breast biopsy with MR guidance, maybe CESM is the answer, and time will tell. So why, with all the good uh, information and research that has come out about CESM over the last 10 years, why aren't more people utilizing it? And I've heard that some people are afraid that it's going to compete with their MRI practice. But we know that there are many patients who have indications for breast MRI, but only a small fraction of them actually undergo the procedure. Some of that is because of contraindications, but others may be because of financial barriers or um, dislike for the uh, procedure. It's an uncomfortable exam, it's lengthy. The physicians may not order it because they are dissatisfied with the number of false positives. But I think by having CESM as an alternative, we have the opportunity to increase the number of patients at risk who are actually screened with this wonderful exam. And there are a lot of benefits to CESM. If you look at 10 images instead of 1,000 images, it's much easier for physicians to interpret the examination compared to MRI. And I particularly find this very welcome by our surgeons. The equipment for the patient is located in the mammography suite. It's the same imaging equipment that they're used to being imaged with. And it's performed by the same technologist in the same breast center that they're used to going to. So there's a comfort level uh, that the patients feel by having CESM especially if they've had a prior breast MRI. 
The examination can be performed in less than 15 minutes. It's relatively cheap, and we'll talk about um, payments later, and it's extremely accurate. But for administrators who are considering purchasing of equipment, it is an extremely efficient uh, technology. With one piece of equipment in one MAMO suite, you can perform both screening and diagnostic mammography, both in 2D and 3D. You can perform stereotactic biopsy in 2D or 3D. You can perform CESM and now CESM biopsy. So it's a very cost-effective purchase. And it can complete um, the imaging examinations for a center, particularly if, they, if it is a small center that currently is not offering breast MRI. If we looked at our volumes year to year with regards to MRI and CESM for an eight-month period from 2019 to 2020, and then again from 2020 to 21, we see we were increased our number of MRIs performed by 15%. In 2020, we instituted abbreviated breast MRI, where we were able to decrease the time allotted for uh, the uh, MRI examination from 40 minutes to 20 minutes. And this gave us the opportunity to do more patients per day. If we look at the same period, we see we increased more significantly CSM by 269%. And I think this is because we increased the indications for the examinations but also our referring physicians became more comfortable with it and knew uh, what the outcomes, uh, the good outcomes could be from CESM. Now let's look about at the patient financials. I think a lot of patients uh, don't, uh, although they are indicated to have breast MRI because of their risk, they don't undergo the procedure because there's a financial barrier. So if we looked at our patients who had a commercial insurance at our center, and they had a high deductible, which was not yet met, the out-of-pocket expense for a screening mammogram would be $0. For a diagnostic mammogram, it is $400. For a screening breast ultrasound, the out-of-pocket expense is $580. For MRI, it's $1,500. And for CESM, as it's billed as a diagnostic mammogram, is $400. So given the opportunity to reduce significantly the um, out-of-pocket expense to patients, again, CESM gives us the opportunity to offer screening to more patients, resulting in better outcomes. Now, if we look at departmental financials, if, patient, if, if um, doctors are worried about shifting of, of cases, we looked at the uh, Medicare allowable for these different examinations. And we find that MRI and CESM, the allowable is not that different. So if you see some shift from MRI to CESM, it's not gonna significantly impact the finances of the department. So when I think about instituting new technology in our department, it has to meet certain criteria before we're gonna introduce it. First of all, it has to fill an imaging or detection gap and there's a gap with mammography, and that's with breast density and masking phenomenon. You don't have that with CESM. With MRI, the gap is poor sensitivity. And again, CESM has higher sensitivity, so you, you eliminate that gap. We know that CESM has high sensitivity and specificity. The risks of iodine contrast injection are minimal with the, the um, most recent uh, low osmolar non-ionic contrast, and the benefits are great. There's not a significant number of false positive or false, false negative exams with CESM. The cost of the equipment is significantly less than that of MRI, and the reimbursement is nearly equivalent to that of MRI. So this is a financial incentive for using this technology. And then it cannot impact the efficiency of the department. And CESM really doesn't. It's in a mammogram room, and the exam is performed just with contrast. And patient acceptance is great, particularly, as I said, if patients have had previous experience with breast MRI. So when considering expanding the indications for the examination, I try to look at what, what are the facts? We know that mammography decreases cancer deaths, but is limited by breast density. And in these patients, we often offer screening with breast ultrasound, which modestly increases the number of cancers we're able to detect. 
We also know that MRI is the most sensitive exam and that patients at all levels of risk benefit. So Dr. Cool, over the last several years, looked at both high, high risk women, intermediate risk and average risk women, and all of them benefited from contrast. Shouldn't we be able to offer this to women of any level of risk and come out with better outcomes, better cancer detection? And what's also interesting about CESM is that there's no authorization. So once you get a prescription for the examination, that examination can be scheduled. Also, if a patient has a negative CESM, there's no need for screening with ultrasound if patient has high breast density. It's a standalone exam. If we look back at this illustration, I think we need to picture it a little bit differently. Maybe I did it wrong initially. So MRI provides functional information. CESM is a better tool because it provides functional information as well as anatomic information. And this is unlike, as I said, any other imaging tool that we have. So in summary, CESM is a mammogram which provides both functional and anatomic information. There are multiple indications, and I believe it should be offered to many women, all of who qualify for um, diagnostic mammography or breast MRI. There is a lack of quality variability because there's standardized imaging acquisition, and that's unlike breast MRI. The equipment is readily available in our departments as a mammographic unit. And the implementation is easy. It's only teaching your technologist how to, how to place an IV and obtaining a power injector and getting your radiologist comfortable with dealing with contrast reactions, which are minimal. The examination is fast, performed in under 15 minutes, and it's relatively inexpensive compared to breast MRI. There's high sensitivity and high specificity. There's good patient acceptance and there's no insurance pre-approval required. So I'd like to stop here and just hope that I've made you think that CESM is just a better mammogram. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schilling, for that wonderful talk. Now, before handing it over to Dr. Seamus, we'll do another poll. Again, you'll have about 30 seconds to answer this poll, and hopefully the answers on this one will appear on the screen. So what are the key facts about CESM that make it so relevant for diagnostic mammography? Great, okay. I get no answers, <laughs> but maybe we'll get those later. Okay, um, so um, just remember that hold your, you know, get your Q and A ready for the end of the session so that we can have a nice, robust discussion. Okay, so now it's my pleasure to hand it over to Dr. Jason Shames, um, and he's going to cover how they recently incorporated the technology in their facility and how they involved their referring doctors, and also, which is super exciting, how um, they incorporated contrast-enhanced guided biopsy into their practice. So, Dr. Shames. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris. It's uh, really it's a very pleasure to be here. And um, thank you to GE for allowing me to talk on our uh, institution's experience with contrast. I'm an incredible advocate for the technology and um, and really excited to see how over I think now the next few years we're going to really see this technology explode now that we do have the ability to do biopsy with it. Um, so sort of as a, a combination and to help support what Dr. Schilling was, was talking about, um, screening mammography, again, we know is a wonderful population-based screening tool. We have a great det cancer detection rate of five per thousand women screened as a um, relatively uh, strong positive predictive value of about 25%, an overall sensitivity of 87% and specificity of 89% for detecting breast cancer for average risk women. Uh, but as we were talking about, we know that that sensitivity significantly decreases with both breast and, uh, dense breast uh, density and also other risk factors. And for patients with extremely dense breast tissue drops down to about 40 to 50%. So the supplemental screening and imaging techniques become so critical for these populations to help improve the overall sensitivity of the detection for breast cancer. We currently use whole breast screening ultrasound, 
um, BSGI, breast MRI, and contrast-enhanced mammography at our institution. And we know that the functional exams themselves have the highest sensitivity for cancer detection, uh, but all with some certain limitations to focus with contrast-enhanced mammography. As we also talked about, this technology was FDA approved in the later half of um, 2011 using a, a rapid sequential dual energy uh, to acquire both the low energy functional exam uh, that gives us that ability to see those masses, asymmetries, distortions, and calcifications just like the regular mammography can, but also that functional exam looking at that tumor angiogenesis, similar to what breast MRI can do that's independent of breast density and those other risk factors. Research has been showing that the diagnostic accuracy for mammography and ultrasound are significantly improved when contrast-enhanced mammography is added, and that the, uh, there's a high correlation with the size of lesions that we're able to see on contrast mammography with MR, showing that it can be a, as at least a reliable tool for as MR for, uh, for breast cancer detection um, and size determination with uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy response. And that we're seeing an additional 16 per thousand um, uh, 16 additional cancers per thousand uh, women screened for above average risk women when contrast enhanced mammography is added to that screening for supplemental. Uh, so bringing up to 21 cancers for every thousand. When I um, try to explain for, for patients and providers how the contrast mammogram works and looks, our low energy image that we look again is our similar uh, to our normal mammogram or diagnostic mammogram where we're seeing the normal breast tissue and the cancer is unfortunately depending on how the cancer is presenting can look uh, similar to the normal background tissue where you can't really find it and uh, makes it much more difficult to find. With contrast mammography, when we look at the recombined image, it helps us subtract out that normal breast tissue and allow that area of, of, um, of suspicion to really pop out to help make it so that we can clearly identify where Waldo, Waldo carcinoma is hiding. How our institution now, because of the wonderful um, benefits we've been seeing with contrast, has now um, supported and generated guidelines for our institution for its utility is that we recommend for radiologists um, to consider using diagnostic contrast enhanced mammography for all screening recall patients with dense breasts that have findings that are poorly defined by mammography or have bilateral findings, with patients with pathologic nipple discharge with no mammographic or sonographic correlate. When there's a suspicious palpable finding with uh, no or poorly defined mammographic or sonographic correlates, for um, patients prior to their biopsy of a highly suspicious lesion of uh, Biorad's 4C or 5 lesion to help with that initial local staging, especially for patients with dense breasts. Um, when there's unilateral axillary adenopathy without a definitive mammographic or sonographic correlate, except for those patients with the recent vaccine and the ipsilateral arm. And when concerned for scar versus recurrence for patients with prior breast conservation therapy. For our referring providers, we suggest recommending a, um, ordering a diagnostic mammogram of when there's a concern for a diagnosis of Paget's disease, when there's positive margins after uh, breast conservation therapy, and the addition for staging evaluation for patients with dense breasts, especially for those with biopsy-proven invasive lobular carcinoma or suspected multifocal or multicentric disease, and when assessing response to chemo, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And so this would be done as we would for any other modality where the, um, the imaging has to be done prior to the uh, administration of the neoadjuvant and then for the subsequent evaluation for the effect afterwards. This would be for patients, especially if they have dense breasts, if they're candidates for breast conservation therapy or unable to receive MR. We recommend considering replacing annual screening mammography with annual screening contrast enhanced mammography for women who otherwise meet criteria for supplemental screening with MR but are unable to receive it. So those are with um, greater than 20% lifetime risk based largely on uh, family uh, history models, history of chest radiation between 10 and 30 uh, years of age. And for those with a uh, history of breast cancer, who were treated with breast conservation therapy prior to the age of 50 or over the age of 50 with dense breasts. We suggest that you may consider replacing annual screening mammography with annual screening contrast enhanced mammography for patients with a history of LCIS or ALH, ADH. This would begin um, at the time of diagnosis, but not before age 30, especially for those with dense breasts. And that intermediate dense breast, uh, sorry, intermediate risk category um, like based largely on uh, family history models. And for those with heterogeneous or dense, extremely dense breasts as a, um, as a replacement, again, um, we're looking forward to participating hopefully in the latter half of this year in the CMIS trial, um, which is looking to see um, the, assess the, the differences between screening average risk 
uh, patients with desk breasts with contrast enhanced mammography versus digital breast tonal synthesis uh, to see if there's um, there's truly that, that that clear advantage for screening these patients with this modality and in lieu of uh, DBT. And as I was saying before, I think one of the greatest um, hurdles and things keeping contrast mammography from really exploding since its release in 2011 has been our inability to biopsy findings that we we find on um, contrast enhanced mammography. Um, when the finding is not seen on mammogram or ultrasound, it leads to the patient then requiring an MR to assess if there's um, a target that could be biopsied to help confirm if the area requires any additional treatment. Now that we have that ability, it really can stand on its own uh, on two feet and, and, um, and help patients in extremely beneficial ways given that uh, additional functional uh, examination benefit. This is our first patient that we did. Um, we were able to fortunately perform a contrast biopsy on uh, just to kind of present her story. She presented um, this 69 year old with an obscured mass on screening mammogram in the upper outer left breast. Here on the 2D image in the, um, the upper outer breast, you can sort of see that there's an area that almost looks like a focal asymmetry with distortion and Tomo was able to define a little bit more of the mass. Um, she went on to contrast enhanced mammography given the difficulty of, of truly defining the lesion, but the high suspicion that there was something there that would require something more. And we can clearly see the primary lesion, but what this also showed was clustered masses in a more segmental pattern heading towards the nipple. When she went on for targeted ultrasound, the only thing that we were able to find in the breast was the primary lesion. No other suspicious findings were seen in the breast or axilla. After biopsy of that mass by ultrasound, it demonstrated invasive lobular carcinoma. So a patient otherwise, um, because these areas of high suspicion, especially given her um, diagnosis of an invasive lobular carcinoma, she would have to go on to MR and then subsequently was delayed for getting that MR and then um, come back again for MR biopsy, but we were fortunately able to move her right into the contrast biopsy. Here's an ex um, uh, image of the, uh, the biopsy scalp. We were able to see the, uh, the lesion. After the scalp, we do the, um, the stereo pair, showing the um, negative 15, positive 15 uh, views of the breast with the low energy and recombined images where we can see the area of concern um, clearly identifying. We set our target I always perform a post lidocaine um, examination as well. I do find um, I, I've had too many times where either from patient movement or just movement from the, the bolus of the uh, injection that the target moved enough that it would be hard to target it after you've already inserted the needle. Um, and in this case too, we noticed the target had shifted a little bit. Uh, so we confirmed and made the target go right in the spot that we wanted it to did our pre-fire image and we're able to see clearly that the needle tip is right prior to the mouse to know that it's gonna be, um, that we're in a, in a great position for our biopsy capture. And our post-fire imaging, we're able to see that with the open trough, the uh, mass of concern is within the trough. And then we do, uh, I typically do just a single post just to make sure the clip deployed um, after deploying and rotating the device. Post-procedure uh, um, mammogram confirmed um, the location of the um, biopsy marker in our target was in the anterior most area of those clustered masses. Looking back on our original mammogram, we're able to see again that uh, our biopsy was performed in that location, and the second site came back as invasive lobular carcinoma as well. So being able to perform this exam for this patient not only allowed us to um, more quickly determine her true extent of disease, where there would have been a significant delay waiting for an MRI and MRI biopsy, um, but also help to ensure that her treatment was appropriate in the first time. These lesions um, from um, the most posterior aspect to anterior aspect are over six centimeters. So there's high likelihood that this um, would have came back with positive margins and she would have moved on to additional surgery or that the treatment itself would have been an incomplete. Um, so a wonderful effect for this patient to make sure that we're providing the, the best care possible upfront in a timely manner, cost-effective manner, and in a way that was very comfortable for the patient. Um, just to kind of review how we perform um, our workflow in our clinic for the contrast biopsy, prior to the examination, uh, we review the case with the technologist to help really define um, our plan A, how we're going to approach this specific lesion, and what's going to be our alternative if there's any complications so that we can rapidly move on to the next step. Because uh, you're limited, again, with about 10 minutes uh, for the procedure, so you want to make sure that if anything does happen that you can um, quickly move on to the next um, the next, the next plan. Uh, we then um, 
After when the patient arrives, we use a 22 gauge for peripheral IV. Uh, if unable to do a 22, we do a 24 with the AC uh, and a cubofossil being the preferred site for um, comfort of the injection. Um, prior to the injection, if there's a little bit of delay for the patient to come into the room, uh, do a manual flush, and then they um, will uh, connect to the power injector to get a, um, a patency test. We do 10 milliliters, meter, 10 milliliters sorry, of normal saline. At, uh, three mils per second is our flow rate that we do for our procedures, just to make sure that there's no issue with the pressure and the flow rate uh, and or discomfort for the patient. Then we do the injection of 1.5 milli, uh, milligrams per kilogram of OmniPay 350 at three mils per second, followed by a 20 mil flush. That um, flow rate does reduce down to two mils per second if we do a 24 gauge insertion. Uh, disconnect from the injector, and the patient um, all throughout this time is, is in the seated position. Um, for the typical mammogram, a contrast mammogram, they would stand up and move over to the gantry for the normal mammographic views. Uh, for the biopsy, they stay um, seated um, in the uh, injection chair, and then are just kind of moved into the um, in, towards the gantry, and then not placed into compression until those two minutes have passed. At that two-minute bark, then you just perform your stereo um, as you would normally. And again, as I, I as I recommend, um, we do the scalp to help confirm our target is within the safety window followed by the stereo pair to set your target. I do always do a post um, lidocaine stereo pair, uh, followed by the pre-fire, post-fire, and the single view post clip. On that patient that I just showed you, again, it took us 10 minutes from the start of injection, to, I think 10 minutes, three seconds, um, to the time that we were done with the exam. Um, so with it, even doing those six imaging um, uh, pairs, we were able to do it with the, well within the timeline that we have to visualize the target. Uh, to show another example of a patient that benefited from um, having the ability to do contrast mammogram and well as contrast biopsy is a 55-year-old woman who presented with bilateral bloody nipple discharge. On her diagnostic mammogram, we saw a little bit of ductectasia, but nothing really stood out as what could be causing the, um, her symptomatology. Did a um, target ultrasound of both breasts and the retroareolar breast. And we're able to find an introductal mass in the right breast and two masses, um, one introductal um, in the left breast. Because of the multiplicity of findings and that we weren't able to truly see something on the mammogram, she went on to contrast mammography, which didn't demonstrate that single area of enhancement in the right and what we believe were the two areas that we were able to see on the left breast. On ultrasound guided core biopsy, that right breast finding um, came back as an introductal papilloma without atypia. Uh, the one lesion in the left breast came back as an introductal papilloma without atypia which is represented by a coil clip. And the third finding came back as benign breast tissue with fibrocystic changes, and that's the ribbon clip. Because we were, um, we found that, that that other finding was a little bit discordant from what we were expecting. Uh, we went back, she had another contrast mammogram. It was able to confirm, uh, and when we look back, sorry, did not have another contrast mammogram. We will look back at um, our, our contrast mammogram to help confirm that the findings were corresponding to those areas of enhancement. And we can see the coil clip in the left breast and the coil clip in the right breast do correspond to those areas of enhancement. But the ribbon clip is anterior lateral to the uh, coil clip and not in the uh, location where we see this other focus of enhancement. Because of this and because of her desire to go on to surgical excision to help reduce her symptomatology of the um, bloody nipple discharge, we did go on um, for uh, contrast biopsy of this other area to help confirm that this wasn't something, uh, either a cancer or something else that would require treatment prior to her definitive care. On a scout imaging, we were able to see the target. On the um, post fire, again, that the um, area of enhancement was within the trough. Our post clip showing that the um, clip deployed in our expected uh, area. And on our post biopsy mammogram, again, that the post biopsy changes in clip is now in the area of enhancement. And this finding came back again as, a, um, as an additional site of an introductal papilloma without atypia. So if this area wasn't sampled, it is possible that if she went on for her definitive care for the nipple discharge in the left, that this wouldn't fully have resolved her, um, her bloody nipple discharge and she still would have been presenting with symptomatology and a finding that, um, again, some might argue is something that we at least try to be a little bit more um, uh, vigilant on follow-up to ensure it doesn't require anything additional or that we do surgically excise um, even without the atypia, um, that this finding can also be definitively uh, treated while she was going on for her surgery. 
So in conclusion, there's several different imaging techniques that we have available to help enhance our screening and diagnostic effectiveness of mammography. Mammography is our gold standard and should be the backbone, um, but having these other um, supportive tools really do help to uh, enhance our ability to take care of our patients the best way possible. In contrast, enhanced mammography provides a highly sensitive, highly specific and accurate very well tolerated and cost effective functional exam um, imaging solution for uh, many diagnostic and screening scenarios for our patients. And that due to the ease of updating current mammography equipment uh, and the ability to perform both the imaging and biopsy with contrast now, I believe that this technology without a doubt um, give countless women throughout the world a chance for a cure where one would otherwise not be possible. And I'm extremely excited to help promote the technology and answer any questions that, uh, that you have. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Seamus. And I now have another poll for you. Uh, when should radiologists consider a diagnostic contrast mammogram? Please vote. You have 30 seconds. Okay, I think that's 30 seconds. Um, oh, here we go. Okay, so all of the above got 95% and 6% for clinical suspicious palpable. Uh, thank you, everyone. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the round table with Q&A. Um, no slides here, but we're, we're gonna start with some important questions. Please remember that you can submit your own questions. I noticed many of you have in the widget. Uh, so, first question just for the two speakers is um, when you implemented your contrast program, contrast MAMO program, what, what were the sort of stumbling blocks that you encountered? What were, what were the most important aspects to consider? Why don't we go with Dr. Schilling first? So stumbling blocks, um, I think, um, one was a difficulty in our having the um, breast imagers feel comfortable having iodine contrast in the department and being able to deal with uh, potential contrast reactions. So that took a little bit of work. Uh, we had to also work with our technologists to t have, make them feel comfortable placing IVs. Um, so we let them spend some time with the um, CT um, technologists and, and learn from them. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's just anytime you start something new, you know, you have to do your homework and you have to feel like it's something that's right for the department. Um, I think CESM was relatively easy to implement um, because it had such great outcomes and, and great potential. Um, so really, it was really minor um, problems that we faced in implementation of the exam in our department. Great. Dr. Seamus? Um, I think similarly, it, it all, getting the technologists because we we are independent. Um, one of our sites is independent from from CAT scan, so not used to uh, having the technologists start the IV. Um, that was a simple training, and um, fortunately, everybody really became more excited about doing it. Um, uh, understanding how we're going to do the workflow um, was also something that we had a um, we sort of had to understand uh, for when the patients are coming in. Our institution has a, um, a check for um, for um, the, we use the Choiki questionnaire for GFR, uh, making sure that the patient's going to be safe for the injection, and um, and after that, it really became very simple. Um, we um, um, use in our other department was, is a more of an uh, imaging a, a full imaging center, um, so it was um, they were very used to having contrast in the department. Uh, always already had that um, that mindset. Uh, so it was a little bit simpler in that, in that, that location. Yeah, we found the same thing. It was, uh, you know, the contrast and the, actually the worry about contrast reactions. We were very concerned about that at first, but having done 9,000 um, exams, we have not had a serious one. Of course, we've had, you know, minor contrast reactions. Um, and, um, and also getting uh, the technologists trained. So it's important to, I think, identify super techs 
and that someone is um, the point person for this on the technology side. We had nurses put in IVs and that had to be arranged. Um, but we started out checking creatinine, but we no longer do anymore. Unless there's, um, you know, luckily the new ACR guidelines came out that you do not have to check um, on every patient getting receiving contrast. So I'm curious, do you both now check creatinine still or no? Um, so for us only if there are um, positive questions in the Troiki questionnaire. Okay. Uh, so okay. independent of age, uh, but just question of if there's any, any risk for um, renal impairment. Great. Okay. So there's lots of questions about billing and lots of questions about how do you bill, um, how do you read them? I will say that in our practice, we treat them as a diagnostic mammogram. We eat the cost for the contrast and we just bill as a diagnostic mammogram and we give results same day. How do you do it in your practices? Let's start with Dr. Schilling. So we bill as a diagnostic mammogram and we add the um, small incremental cost for contrast uh, and disposables. We haven't had any problems that I'm aware of um, in collecting on that. Uh, we read them real time. We read, read everything in our department, real time screening and diagnostics. So the patients uh, will stay until uh, we've looked at the exam. Uh, if we see an area of concern, we'll do a targeted ultrasound um, at that point. Um, there's some discussion about background parenchymal enhancement, and it's really not as significant as we experience with breast MRI. Although I think one of the um, most difficult uh, um, aspects for the, the breast imagers to get used to is that nodular background parenchymal enhancement and what's normal and what is, needs to be um, a, a concern and evaluated. We do not uh, schedule our patients at this point um, with respect to their um, menstrual cycle. Um, as we do with breast MRI. So BPE is not as significant an issue uh, for uh, CESM. But we do read everything real time and try to get an answer to that patient before she leaves. All right, I would just suggest, I don't think you need to screen, do your MRIs with respect to cycle. I think that's been debunked, but but um, but appreciate, yeah, it's true that I think the background parental enhancement exists. It's not so much a problem, but um, Dr. Seamus, is that your experience too? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, so, so similar to Dr. Schilling, we do the diagnostic mammogram with a modifier to cover the cost for the uh, injectable. Um, and then um, for the background, uh, we, and we also have a radiologist who's reading it real time. I think that's a, a very helpful practice. Um, this helps to um, mitigate some of the artifacts that could be seen um, to allow the more trained eye to see, oh, this area I want to spend a little bit more attention for, do repeat, do an XCCO, I want to get a true lateral. Um, you can, on that decision making, also do spot compression with contrast. Uh, we sometimes add in the um, TOMO to help to, um, um, differentiate, the fi differentiate the finding and, and um, modify our level of sus uh, suspicion uh, based upon the background parenchymal enhancement. Um, so that being there in the room, I think, is really important to help um, guide the procedure well. Uh, we have a lot of time to do additional imaging uh, that we found, um, So, but it, you have to be in the room to know that it has to be done. And then for the background parenchymal enhancement, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, um, surrounding that, there's been a couple of questions about um, doing tomosynthesis with contrast mammo. Um, can you just comment on that because you just uh, said something? Sure. I'm aware that I'm unaware that there. I, I think there's only a few centers that actually do tomosynthesis with contrast. Most of these are just 2D, right? In your experience, right? So it, it's 2D. Um, how I say that we incorporate DBT is that without um, when you're doing the initial contrast examination, you just set the gantry to not do an auto release, so the breast stays in the position. And then you can immediately acquire the D, uh, the DBT image afterwards to help use that to, um, with your your diagnostic um, determination of the finding. Uh, so when there's a if there's a question um, for what you're seeing mammographically, it helps it so that uh, if the patient is presenting to you, you don't have that DBT um, um, comparison before uh, for for their their diagnostic reason. You can acquire all three if it's helpful um, uh, to your for your determination of what's going on. Uh, but not that the DBT itself is contrast, where you're able to see uh, each Tomo slice with a um, recombined image. Right. Um, 
couple of questions about offsite um, screening mammography centers. Um, do you, without radiologists on site, do you see contrast mammo um, being used there? Dr. Schilling, you're shaking your head. <laughs> no, I do not. Um, certainly there has to be somebody there who can take care of problems should they arise yeah. with the contrast injection. So no, it has, you have to have a physician on site. Um, okay. Uh, oh, Dr. Berg wants to know about overheating the machine so that you can only do one every 45 minutes with contrast. I, that has not been a problem in our practice. Has that been a problem overheating um, with uh, using contrast mammography because it's just a 2D? I, see, I haven't noticed that. Um, so um, this was something I was also just checking when we initially started doing it, um, thinking that there could be just delay because you you do you're doing these two image acquisitions. Um, that to acquire each projection, it's six seconds. It's roughly six to eight seconds. So the um, the gantry itself just does a, a rapid cycle. It does that automated exposure to determine the the power um, for the for the acquisition. It gives you your two D, and then it gives you the high energy. Um, it's, it's happening so quickly, and typically for most patients, you're doing just the four views um, that I haven't, I haven't noticed any limitation on, on being able to perform that exam, or that room then turns into a routine um, screening diagnostic room right after, and we don't have any interruptions with our care. And Dr. Moore, yeah. yeah. I think it's recommended that it not be performed on patients with implants. So if we have patients with implants that we want to use the ESM, we do the implant displaced view so that the uh, implant is out of the field of view and you don't have any problem with tube heating. Yeah, we, uh, we use um, contrast memo on implant patients too with just displacement views, no problems. Dr. Schilling, a couple of workflow issues. Um, uh, how, how many patients could you do per day with your uh, workflow? I mean, how long how long does the room take to turn over with the contrast mammo? Well, we're not as efficient as we should be. I know that we schedule them um, at one hour time slots. Um, but if you can move the IV placement and the pre 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 exam um, evaluation of the patient to another room, you can turn over that room very quickly. It's really 15 minutes in the room um, during the injection and obtaining the images. So I think that's key is to have a um, place where an IV can be positioned and the patient can be um, evaluated to improve your efficiency. Yeah. Another question uh, for Dr. Schilling um, about reimbursement practices. Do you feel that um, some, some sites may want to do MRI instead of contrast mammo. You addressed this a bit in your talk. You know the competing reimbursement issues that you may be getting more from MR, but you kind of showed that you could be getting equivalent, at least with the Medicaid patients. Yeah, yeah. The Medicaid, the allowable is almost equivalent. Um, and there's, I believe that there's so many people who you know qualify for breast MRI but just don't go through it because of financial barriers or because it's an uncomfortable examination so so we have found the same it doesn't compete um, I am a strong proponent of contrast whether it be with contrast mammo or MRI we do not have the capability to screen all the women we need to screen with contrast using our existing base with MRI this is a way to expand to a huge number of women and who could benefit from this really important technology. And having lived through the rollout of MRI um, into clinical practice, it's, um, you know, uh, I think now having a biopsy capability that is robust and easy to perform is going to actually change the whole landscape that we can do these, con you know, these contrast biopsies. Um, how, how, how do you see it? Why isn't it more adopted, do you think, in clinical practice? What are the barriers in your, um, in your uh, mind? Dr. Seamus first. And so uh, I think, you know, part of that barrier has been our inability to do a biopsy. So it's wonderful to find a finding, but if you can't determine if it requires a treatment, adequ adequately localize it or sample it, um, then you're sort of left standing and you need to move on to some other functional imaging source. So now that we have that ability to biopsy these findings, I, I really see very limited um, things holding the technology back and allowing it to really become more ubiquitous throughout the country and the world. 
Um, where MR, you know, like again, uh, to, to just to support what you're saying, functional imaging has um, an incredible role for patients. Um, but for various limitations, MR um, is not necessarily capable in the middle of nowhere. Where a very cost effective update to a machine, you can have contrast mammography with biopsy capability. Uh, for people who might be more comfortable doing stereos, they're doing stereos, but they're doing maybe an MR biopsy once in a blue moon. This allows a more easier transition to also be able to sample those findings in those those facilities that are um, that are, are not a higher volume MR uh, location, uh, but still providing that patient population this this game changing technology. Um, I know that there's concerns for radiation exposure. It's still well within the um, the um, expected requirement um, under three. Um, um, uh, for per projection, as I also relate it for patients who are questioning that, um, it, it's well below the background radiation exposure of patients who live in Colorado. So from birth till um, till death, patients who live in Colorado are receiving two mammograms a year, and we would expect to see a higher incidence of cancer for that patient population, but in reality it has a lower cancer incidence than the rest of the country, uh, than the average of the country. So that minimal increased radiation exposure that patients are getting um, for having a contrast mammogram is really, I, I think, going to play a very minimal role in affecting the patient. Um, for the contrast reaction, I know that's a concern too. Uh, we've also seen very limited, and, and uh, most sites are, are not limiting how much CAT scan they're doing um, because they haven't really seen any of that, that um, really having an impact on the patient uh, and that population. And after the patients have that exam, most people say, I, it's over, I can't believe it, that was so easy, uh, especially right. those who had an MR and have that comment. Yes. Um, yes. I agree. Okay, I'm getting a notification to wrap on up. I really want to um, thank you both for your experience. I do want to let the audience know that there is there are books out on contrast mammogram. Um, there is the CMIS trial that Dr. Seamus um, referenced. So that's the contrast mammography trial. Um, there are efforts for BIRADS, incorporating um, BIRADS uh, in contrast mammo BIRADS in the next round um, of the BIRADS. And the big thing is biopsy is now available. So um, thank you for the great discussion. Um, and um, my wrap up is I just want to thank everyone for um, being here, uh, for Dr. Kathy Schilling, Dr. Jason Seamus, um, and Celeste, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Dr. Morris, and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, on behalf of GE, we do appreciate your, your time and interest, uh, your patience with the polling, uh, but more so for the great questions in, um, that you've posted in the widget. Any questions we have not gotten to, we will send them out uh, via email, and this event uh, will conclude. It was recorded, and we will make it available in the next couple of days. Enjoy your SBI. Thank you. Thank you.